So uh, if you have your, well, we're going to just read it together, okay? Uh, I think Corey's got it all lined up. And we're going to go from Genesis to Luke to Revelation. And it's a hodgepodge of Scripture that we're covering this morning. We're going to be doing about three chapters of, of Revelation. And so, uh, uh, by the way, we won't finish Revelation because we're not going to be preaching next week. We, the royal we, okay? But, uh, but I'll be preaching from Parker back to Riverton on the 3rd. So we will finish Revelation, okay? And, uh, and then I think I'm going to do kind of a little podcast and go back on a deep dive through Revelation after that. But anyway, um, let's read. Let's stand as we read the scripture this morning, okay? We begin in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur." And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. According to a study in 2012 at the University of British Columbia, a research team identified what they called the dark triad of three antisocial personality traits. Number one was narcissistic self-promotion. Number two was manipulation of others. Three was impulsive uh, psychopathy. And in 2013, a fourth element was added, which was sadistic pleasure. To these were added egoism or extreme selfishness. And uh, finally, was spitefulness. And those characteristics, they said, described evil. Now, I'm not sure they perfectly describe evil. In fact, the Bible refers to the mystery of evil. And I'm not sure we can summarize evil in six uh, uh, easy uh, dark traits. But, uh, but one of the things that we see in the Bible is that that sin was a serious issue from the very beginning. We mentioned in the children's sermon that, that, that God uh, didn't design sin to even be present in the world. We kind of fouled it up. We, cleaned, uh, we messed up the room that God gave us, okay? It was pristine when we received it, and we proceeded to mess it up with sin. And the nature of sin, then, is that sin begins to grow and get bigger, 
And sin also begins to spread and go further. And, and when we look at the Bible, that's what happened. Sin began to spread throughout the world. Now, it's interesting that as sin grew and spread, the world became corrupt. At one point in uh, Genesis 7 to 9, it says God brought a flood and just said, this is a real mess. Let's start over again. And, uh, and so we, we see then this seriousness of sin. Now, now, we live in a day where we don't really want to talk about sin. In fact, we would prefer to just ignore it and minimize it and say it's really nothing significant. But it's really that one element that destroys life in so many ways. And as sin begins to grow, life and society and the world begin to, to become corrupt in so many ways. And the world is, becomes like an old shirt that is stained and torn and unsightly. And while you, as the guy in the family, thought that shirt could possibly be repaired, your wife told you, please, get rid of that ghastly thing, okay? And, and she added to that, and by the way, burn it, okay? And just get a new shirt. Now, a lot of people think that God should just repair the world when the book of Revelation makes it clear that the world is beyond fixing and that what we really need is a new world. Well, that's what God is doing here in these last chapters of Revelation. The stain of sin has gone so deep by the end of the Bible and the extent of sin has become so widespread that God simply says, let's start over with a new world. Now, I think what happened in Genesis 7 to 9 with the flood is a parallel to what is going to happen in those last days. You see, we tend to think <clears throat> that the sin problem is not actually as bad as it is. And even in our individual lives, we think that all we need is a little reformation of our old life. When God says, just throw out that old life. Get rid of it. It's useless. It's ugly. It's unsightly. And like the old shirt, even ghastly. And he says, and then I'll give you a new one. That's what God does. He gets rid of our old life. And he replaces that old life with a new life. Now, at that point of trusting in Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit of God enters the human soul to give us his new life. God has offered us his grace and mercy for 2,000 years. But when his offer of grace and mercy has been finally and completely rejected, there's nothing left but judgment. Again, that's what we see in Revelation 17 to 19. In our own lives, if we have not received the new life of Christ, we have nothing to offer to God except the worn out filthy rags of our old sin-stained and tattered life. And to no surprise, God just throws it away as unfit for heaven. In Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, there we read, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind our sins sweep us away. But when we come to the end of history, God is throwing away more than just our individual life. God is throwing away a world system. He's just saying, I've had enough. <laughs> I've had enough. 
because I'm going to bring a new and redeemed kingdom of God to earth. So in a sense, what happens in our individual lives as we come to Christ is what God is going to do in the larger panorama of history is he's going to put the old to death in order to bring about the new. Now, in Isaiah chapter 65, in verses 17 and 18, there God says, See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. Now, again, that's what we're witnessing in chapters 17 to 19. It's what the prophet Isaiah spoke in that passage. And in Revelation 17 to 19, in this final account of history, we see then that evil has reached its pinnacle and everything is corrupted by sin. Everything. Revelation 18, 5 says, For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Now, what, what we read there in, in Revelation is the idea of sin being piled up. Now, those of you who have done, you know, any secretarial work, uh, you've heard the word collate. You know, you stack the papers and you organize them together and, and as you collate them, you know, the stack gets higher. That's the Greek word that's used here for piled up to heaven. It's a big collation of, of sin, okay? And God says, the stack's a little bit too high. It's time to do something uh, about it. There's nothing left for God to do but to throw it all away. The promise that God would send to deliver was an ancient promise that was first made in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, immediately God said, I will send a deliverer, an offspring of woman. Not of man, an offspring of woman, he says. And in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 and in Matthew 1 and verse 23, it says, and a virgin will be with child. You see, the promise of Genesis 3.15, we're told, is fulfilled in that simple statement, and a virgin will be with child. Now, in that passage in Genesis, God also told Satan that this deliverer will crush your head. You will be crushed by this coming deliverer born of woman. But before all that would happen, God would offer peace and mercy to those who would accept his offer. And in Luke's gospel, we read that the deliverer first came as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. That was the deliverer in that manger in Bethlehem. That baby would grow to a man and die in our place to purchase our peace with God but he would also be resurrected from the dead to offer us the life of God. He was going to deal with sin in us before he would return again and deal with the sin all around us. God begins by cleaning up the room on the inside of our individual lives. But by the end of Revelation, he's saying, I'm cleaning up all the sin that's on the outside that has affected everything. However, by that end of Revelation, that offer of grace had been rejected over and over again by men who desired their own ways above those of God. And now, the Deliverer would come again to bring evil to an end throughout his creation. That's what 17 through 19 of Revelation is about. God is bringing evil to to an end. Satan, defeated at the cross and the resurrection then will fight his final battle as the world is delivered from every trace of evil and the enemy is conquered forever. At his first coming, the deliverer comes with his offer of grace, but now the deliverer will come in judgment. In chapter 17, 
we have a description of the great prostitute who rides upon the beast. Confusing image when we look at, at that passage. And the reference here seems to point to the city of Rome as the prostitute. And the Roman Empire is the beast that she rides upon and controls. In Revelation 17 and verse 18, it says, The beast which you saw once was, now is, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. We can go into a lot of study on that, but we don't have time. The inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This prostitution that is described in this 17th chapter is most likely a religious syncretism that was characteristic of the greater Roman culture of that day. And the syncretism of Rome, all of their gods that that were being worshipped in Rome were all of the gods that were also worshipped in Greece were all of the gods that were worshipped in ancient Babylon. And, and so mankind was not worshipping the one God. That was the general uh, trend, was man had forgotten God. Now, uh, that Roman culture then was really spreading throughout the earth, but but Rome was, was the key point where it all began. It was the source. The warning to the church, however, was that to interact with this worldly syncretism or the prostitute of Revelation 17 was to risk watering down the apostolic teaching as the churches had originally received it. And the church, when we look at the letters of John, it's obvious when we look at First and Second Peter, when we look at Jude, which we looked at a few weeks ago, you know, all of those point to this tendency towards prostituting the Christian faith to make it something other than it is, to fit in with all the multiple gods of Roman culture. And it must have been a great temptation to the early Christians to just fit in with the broader culture surrounding them and believe whatever the culture believes. But you see, that's still a temptation in our day. We still say, well, we should fit in. And we, in the process, lose our distinctiveness as Christians. We're silent when we should speak. Paul earlier warned Christians about this danger. In Romans 12, 2, Paul writes to to Rome, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It says, have a new way to think as a Christian. Let your mind be renewed so that you're not pressed into this mold of, of the world. It says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Peter warned of these same dangers of identifying with the world and getting involved in its sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. But says you are a chosen people. The, the King James, I think, says it wonderfully. You are a peculiar people. Okay? It says you're to be distinctive. That was, I think, part of this whole image of the prostitute in, in Revelation 17. And uh, Peter goes on in verse 11. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. Now, one of the things that, that this false teaching that was beginning to influence the church was it was saying sin doesn't make any difference. The important thing is you're spiritual. And you can be spiritual and sinful in it at the same time. And you don't have to worry about morals or ethics or sins or values or virtues. Just be as sinful as you feel like, as long as you're spiritual. And it was threatening the core of Christian theology. False teachers were infiltrating the church and seducing believers to participate with them in their sinful behavior. 
In 2 Peter 2, in verse uh, 14, it says, with eyes full of adultery, there's that prostitution theme again. These false teachers, it says, they never stop sinning. And they're encouraging others to participate in their sin. They seduce the unstable. You hear the image of, of prostitution in that. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. Now in Matthew, we see that Satan even tempted Jesus with the easy way of compromise with the world. In Matthew chapter 4, and verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And how did the devil tempt Christ? Notice in verses 8 through 10 of that same chapter. The devil, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. You see, the temptation of the world. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And you see, too often as Christians, we can be guilty of uh, worshiping the world and losing our soul in the process. And that was, I think, the danger in that early church. In his letters then, John also recognizes this very same danger. In, in 1 John, we're doing a little Bible study here. In 1 John 2.15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. John encourages Christians to come out and stand apart from this world system that is about to be destroyed. He says it's all going to come to an end. And if you're putting all your eggs in the basket of the world, it will fall. In Revelation 18 and verse 4, then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people. That was the challenge to Christians in that first century. So that you will not share in her sins. So that you will not receive any of her plagues. You see, the danger was that Christianity was going to lose its distinctiveness and lose any aspects of holiness in the lifestyle of those believers. So that you will not receive any of her plagues. Then in verse 8, it says, Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Now a lot of this goes back to the seven bowl judgments. This is an extension of those bowl judgments that we looked at in chapter 16. And, uh, and so if this prostitute represents the religion and culture of Rome, the danger to believers was that they could be invisibly drawn into its power, much like a prostitute luring her prey. She's saying, come with me. Nothing can happen. The book of Proverbs says, we'll keep it all secret. No one will know. And so John compares the, the religion and culture of Rome to a, a prostitute. At times, even in our own day, the church can be drawn into cultural sin that can seem so innocent because everyone else is doing that sin. And we say, so it's okay for me because everyone else is doing it. And you see, we have been lured by the prostitute of culture into the sin of that culture and we have made excuses for that sin because Everybody's doing that in our culture. And so we lose our distinctiveness. And it becomes, cult sin then at that point becomes culturally acceptable or a particular sin. So the surrounding civilization can be seductive. And seeking acceptance by the larger society can lead us into compromise. Now let's go back to 1 John 2 and verses 16 and 17. It says, for everything in the world, there's that, Word, world again. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All those things that the world offers. It says, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, which is what we see in Revelation 17 to 19. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. You see, John was challenging those believers to stand firm. And it's what he's saying also in Revelation. Now, John sees that the world 
and its values will certainly pass away. He sees clearly that Rome and its values will fall, but even more clearly, he sees that there is a future kingdom of man, the kingdom of the beast, and he says that will also be destroyed. In a real sense, John is showing us in that, that in that future day, every aspect of the world will be infected and influenced by evil. It will be the world just before the flood hit in the days of Noah. The religious system will be compromised with the pagan religions. The cultural system will become separated from its religious and moral base. And all that will be left of the political system will be raw power that controls the people it rules. Any semblance of legal rights or principles of law will disappear. And all that will be left is raw power. In 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2 and verse 3, it says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. There's a reference there in Paul's writing to 2 Thessalonians to the Antichrist. So in our own nation... When the foundation of Christianity is gone, the culture begins to deteriorate until eventually the political system can only hold things together by the force of its will and the limitation of freedom within that society. Needless to say, this all eventually leads to the collapse of the whole house of cards. But when all that is left is political power, John indicates in this revelation that the system will also fight to defend its existence. Even if nothing in that system works any longer or is really even worth fighting for. So we see here in Revelation that the whole worldly system gathers up all its force to resist the one and only one who could ever fix that system. In Revelation 16, at the sixth bowl judgment, we read that the kings of the world gathered to do battle on the great day of God Almighty at the place called Armageddon. This will be the time of Christ's appearing and the final deliverance from evil on the earth. Let me just read you some passages here very quickly. Revelation 16, 14 through 16. They are demonic spirits that perform signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. So it says these demons are deceptive. And what do they use? They go out and they utilize propaganda to deceive the kings and draw them into this great battle. We're seeing more and more propaganda in our day, okay? Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Then in verse 17, the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. We go on in that passage. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. So this is the nations, the armies of the world, but unified under one authority of that world antichrist. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. And there's a description of that when we get into chapter 19 which we will look at in just a second. Then uh, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. Remember, Revelation began early on with the image of a white horse, but it was the Antichrist. Now the rider on the white horse is Christ, who is returning at this time of great crisis. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. He's not the fake. This is the real, faithful and true, the Messiah. With justice, he judges and wages war. We go on in that passage. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. 
The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And so the armies of God are returning with him. God is claiming his property. And he's saying, I will take ownership of this planet. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which, he, uh, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. We go on. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs on his behalf wasn't, didn't take long to conquer them, okay? If God in human flesh returns, an army of millions is really no match, okay? And it says, he captured and with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Now you see, this is the final deliverance from evil. And it will only happen when Christ returns. All of our attempts at world peace without the Prince of Peace are for naught. All of our attempts at reforming the world will never be successful until the deliverer comes. Now, So what do we see here? We see the evil of false religion demolished. We see the wickedness of a corrupt culture destroyed. We see the swamp of political evil finally drained. And we see the Antichrist and the false prophet cast alive into the lake of fire, the source of, of the earthly deception and evil. But we also see Satan as the source of all of that evil, finally constrained, it says, for a thousand years. Revelation 20 in verses 1 through 3. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Now that thousand years will... Look at that on the 3rd of January, okay? Um, but, uh, but the question is, how does all this happen? It happens through a deliverer. The one promised in Genesis, who came to a manger in Bethlehem, who now comes as the rider on a white horse, to bring final judgment upon the evil that has done such incredible damage to God's beautiful creation. For that rider on a white horse is none other than the babe in Bethlehem. The rider on the white horse is none other than the crucified Christ. The rider on the white horse is none other than the risen Lord. He is the promised deliverer who has come to rid the world of sin. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He alone will deliver his world from the evil that has plagued it throughout the ages. And he alone will restore his people to a holy separation that flows from a love for God and a desire for real holiness. It's not holiness because we have to or God threatens us. It's a holiness because we want to. Because we love our Redeemer. In that day, the deliverer will come and the age-old prayer will be answered in full. Lord, deliver us from evil. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you are the fulfillment of that first prophetic statement in Genesis 3 and 15. You are the fulfillment of the promise in Isaiah 7, 14 of a virgin who will be with child. And Lord, you are that deliverer who offers us deliverance right now. But one day you will finally and fully and completely deliver the world of even the presence of the sin that has invaded our world. Lord, 
we thank you that even in this Christmas season, we celebrate our deliverer, born in a manger in Bethlehem, but we also celebrate our deliverer who will come again as the rider on the white horse to bring victory. And Lord, as you bring victory, as you overcome, as the word says in the original language, we too will overcome and we will be victors. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.